Okay. Um, before we get started, we've got uh, we've got a guest speaker tonight, and uh, John Paul is going to interview our guest. But before we start this, we want to see if there's any announcements. Anybody got any gigs, any events, anything we need to know about? Grace. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Grace. Oh, yeah, my band Cute Machines has a gig this Saturday at Cafe Britannia. It's $5. The doors are at 9. We're playing with Coyotes and Mobley. They're from Austin, kind of a dance band. They kind of sound like Block Party. Um, so, yeah, be there. We'll have t shirts. Free. Yep, Sean. Uh, tonight, a One Eyed Jacks, uh, Caddy Wampus, Why Are We Building Such a Big Ship, and Monotonics are playing. You should come out. What time? Just want to say thank you to everybody who came out Friday for uh, Zach One, City Lark, and Erica Flowers. It was a real fun night. We had a great time. Thanks for coming out. Hey, thanks. Yes, sir. Saturday, February 5th, Arrows Fashion, Going Greek. I'm going to be performing there along with Josh Katoy, uh, my boy Awesome. It's going to be nice. It's at 9 o'clock. Be there. Cool. Simple Play presents Ear Funk, One Eye Jacks, this Saturday. Holla. <coughs> Hey, I'm Dustin O'Keefe, and on Thursday I'm releasing the Sleep EP, and I'll be playing a show at the Neutral Ground at 10 to commemorate that. Thank you. Cool. Um, tonight in Baton Rouge, Sean Hotel is opening up for Tokyo Police Club at the Spanish Moon. Great. Lots of action here. Uh, the Half Steps are looking for a drummer. We found a bassist. If you're a drummer, <laughs> email us at thehalfsteps at gmail.com. You need a drummer. Okay. Friday night, there's a free show at Bank Street. It's me, I'm Dominique Lejeune, Woo! with The Lollies and Rabbit, and it's going to be tight. Woo! So, come see. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anybody else? Josh. Hey, everybody. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming out at the Hi-Ho Lounge last Friday. It was really, really fun. And uh, if you missed that, you can come this Wednesday to the Frat House. They're having me play with two rock bands. Don't know why. But uh, it should be really fun. And there's also a going to be another hip-hop guy who opened up for Doomtree as well. So it should be pretty fun. Wednesday, 10 o'clock, Frat House. All right, Josh. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, so I wanted to tell you guys that uh, this Friday, uh, Friday night at Cafe Tootie, we're going to be having a hip-hop show. And it's going to Okay, anybody else? We still got our tutorials going on with the center staff if you want to get trained in any kind of audio video production and make money. So be sure to see those guys if you want to do that. So tonight uh, we have a special guest who flew in today from New York or last night and uh, John Paul is going to introduce him. So please welcome John Paul and Steve Smith. Come on up here guys. Let's do it. Jerk, jerk. Turned on? I think so. Hello? Maybe not. Are we getting live Steve yet? Well, while we're waiting, let me tell you a few things about our guest. Steve Smith is the editor, uh, music editor for Time Out New York magazine. He puts out a plethora of music journalism, including concert reviews, music reviews, etc. You can find his works in such esteemed places as the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, Billboard Magazine, Jazz Is, Symphony, and Downbeat. Uh, he also works in a variety of media contexts, including radio, blogs, and if I may say so myself, a damn fine Twitter feed. <laughs> so can we get a warm welcome for Steve Smith? Uh, Thanks. And before I say word one about myself, I just want to say uh, it's really exciting to be here. It's really exciting to see a program like this. Discovering that this is going on down here has been a very cool thing. Uh, learning just yesterday that Bob Rainey is here, whose work I've known for a lot of years was kind of a shock. And then just casually finding out that, that John Schneider, uh, Schneider is helping to run this thing as I was walking over here and sort of stopping dead in my tracks and saying, the John Snyder, whose records for Artist House I've got in my collection and have had for years. So it's kind of a, a real thrill for me in ways that I hadn't anticipated. And thanks for the opportunity. 
Let's, uh, let's get a round of applause for John Snyder, everybody. <laughs> Big dog John Snyder. Right. He's it, literally, literally, he's one of these guys who, it, it's a name that I've known for years and somebody whose name is on a bunch of the records that I cherish in my collection and sort of never had the, the notion that I was going to be randomly meeting or not exactly randomly, I guess it's kind of more karmically meeting. So. Whoever makes those uh, funny Facebook pictures, be sure to take notice. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so Steve, why don't you tell us, uh, or at least for those who don't know, um, what exactly what is the, the inner workings of your job? What sort of is the day-to-day? -day, what does Steve Smith do when he goes into work? Oh, dear God. Um, <laughs> that, that, that changes on a regular basis as, as quickly as the whole notion of what a music journalist is is changing. And that sounds like a sort of superficial answer, but <laughs> we'll, we'll expand. Um, my day job, as, as it were, is as the music editor at Time Out New York, which for, for basis of comparison, you would kind of think about uh, a smaller magazine cut version of Gambit. It's, a, it's a, a weekly arts and entertainment magazine founded back in the 1960s in London and a very, very profitable franchise in terms of uh, city guides to travel around the world. And um, Time Out New York is about 15 years old. I've been there for, uh, incredibly, the last 10 of those years, which is the longest that I've ever been at one job ever in my life, so it's kind of eyebrow raising for me. Um, I started there in 2001 purely as a part-time classical music editor. Um, classical music is a huge part of my background. It's not the be-all and end-all of my musical consumption, but it's a big part of my background and it's where I got my start there. Um, from there, it sort of progressed very naturally as, um, as I just explored my interests. You know, I, um, I was very much and am very much into the sort of leading edge downtown jazz scene. So I started writing about jazz for the magazine. Um, I had this perverse predilection for Swedish death metal and Norwegian black metal and could tell you which was which. Of so course. I started writing about that for the magazine. And eventually, about three years ago, we had a, a, a change of command and I became the music editor as well as still supervising the classical section. So it's this sort of weird bipolar existence where I'm overseeing uh, five staff writers on the pop side, and when I say pop, I'm referring to yeah, basically anything that's not classical. So it's you know, it's it's rock, it's hip hop, it's you know, folk and country, it's blues and it's jazz, and we've even got a, a dedicated section for cabaret since that's such a big thing in New York. Right. So that's that's the day job is I do some writing but I'm also primarily um, assigning, trafficking, editing, and supervising the work of a five-person staff. Cool, cool. Uh, you, you said a day job. You also do, part of your job is to go out and see concerts. Right, and, and that works in two different ways as well because ideally for me to be the best pop editor that I could be, I should be going out to a whole lot of rock shows and a whole lot of pop shows and a whole lot of hip-hop showcases all the time. I actually do that a lot less than I would like to be because um, weirdly enough, uh, and, and I mean this weirdly, um, about five years ago after I had given up on ever breaking into the New York Times, I had had some earlier dalliances where I'd done a couple of freelance Sunday pieces for the Times but couldn't get my calls returned, couldn't get my emails returned. The Times is notorious for this. Um, I'd basically given up on them. and. Um, so when I wanted to write about the music that I was going out and seeing every, every night, um, I started a blog called Night After Night, which was literally that. My, my now wife, then girlfriend, was teaching at the University of Richmond, so we were separated um, for two years. And I just thought, well, wouldn't it be kind of a great thought experience, uh, experiment to go out and hear something every single night and then be really disciplined, come home, and write about what I saw that night. I usually posted somewhere around 2 to 4 a.m. Right. But it was just, it was a matter of giving myself a structure that I wasn't feeling from either time out where we don't review concerts. It's strictly previewing. Um, or, you know, kind of making for myself what I would have done at a place like The Times. And weirdly enough, five years ago, The Times came and found me. So now you are the classical music reviewer for New York Times. Right, right. I'm, uh, there, there are two full-time staff classical music reviewers at the New York Times, and then there are now um, three stringers 
who are purely freelance. We don't have anything more than a signed piece of paper saying what it is that we do. Mm -hmm. um, we get paid by the piece. Um, we're not employees with benefits. But you know, the, the benefit really is that I get to go out and hear all of this great music all of the time. And you know, it, I have to say, you know, if the Times is sending me to the Metropolitan Opera or Carnegie Hall three, four times a week, that leaves very little time for me to go to Madison Square Garden or to all of the indie rock clubs on Ludlow Street to see what's happening. But it's not the worst problem. You poor happen. soul. I, I know, know. I know. First world <laughs> problems, really. Uh, so how did, I mean, obviously, well, maybe not, I guess, but when you were six, you didn't, uh, you didn't sit down and say, yes, the astronaut's fine, the cowboy's fine, but I, I'm going to write about classical music. What was, what was the journey? How did you get from astronaut or cowboy to whatever it was to mega death writer? Um, it was never astronaut or cowboy for me. I was going to be the drummer for Kiss. <laughs> uh, that was it. Um, because I was an overly literal-minded kid, I thought, well, if I was going to be in KISS, I needed to be a great musician. And so I started studying drums, percussion. I did that for uh, three years of junior high, four years of high school, four years of undergrad, kept playing after I graduated. But being in school band programs in Texas, where, I mean, that's where I grew up. And you know, Texas is very, very strong for school music programs. Um, it gave me a, a kind of crash course into, you know, playing arrangements of Shostakovich led me to discover the real thing. And it was just a process of, of self-education. And, you know, nowadays you can go on the internet and legally or illegally find anything you want to hear. Back then it was 99 cent cassette tapes and I had piles and piles and piles of them and just went through a lot of repertory that way. Also, um, wanting to be as great a musician as Peter Chris, the original drummer of KISS. Here's the sidebar for laughter. Um, uh, he, he claimed to have studied with the great swing drummer Gene Krupa. So I had to investigate jazz. So Gene Krupa led to Louis Belson, led to John Coltrane, led to Ornette Coleman, led to everything that's currently sitting on my shelves, a portion of which with Mr. Snyder's name on the spine. Um, that's, uh, that's how that happened, and I found things to connect to in virtually everything that I was listening to, and I didn't want to compartmentalize my listening, and it all sort of fed each other. Um, you know, I, I didn't understand, for instance, that you were not supposed to listen to punk rock and prog rock at the same time. So I did, and um, you know, I'm not claiming to have invented or discovered anything, but it's kind of funny that now, all these years later, you've got, you know, bands like uh, Trail of Dead or the Mars Volta, who are very, very obviously bringing a prog rock mentality into a sort of more indie you know, stance. So you know, everybody discovers these things in, in a very personal way. There's no proscribed, if you like this, you may not like that. As much as Pandora tries to tell us that. It's true. It's true. So, uh, so obviously, very involved music taste when you were younger. Uh, what was your first career in the music industry? Well, it, this was interesting because, um, you know, in terms of career track, you know, I, again, I, I'm, I've, I've been filled with so much admiration as I've learned about what this program represents. And there was nothing like that when I was an undergrad at Trinity in San Antonio in the 1980s. And in fact, um, I think like just about every kid who feels like his life was saved by a therapist in high school, I originally started out as a psych major. <laughs> And halfway through my sophomore year, I decided there was way too much math involved, and all I really wanted to do was talk to people. And it was a high school band director who said, well, Steve, you've always been pretty good at writing and really good at running your mouth off, so why don't you investigate communications? And literally, that's <laughs> what it was. Um, by my junior year, I was the program director at the radio station. Um, I was the arts editor at the campus newspaper. I was doing a really, really painfully bad comic strip that thankfully there's no trace of on the internet. Um, I was playing in every ensemble on campus, um, you know, from, from the jazz band to the orchestra to the early music collegium musicum. And on the side, I was playing in a sort of gigging freelance, um, like a vocal jazz band, sort of like Manhattan Transfer, where, I mean, thankfully, I was the drummer and kept my mouth shut. Um, 
And every now and then I remembered to go to a class, not, not necessarily enough to save my GPA particularly, but I, I graduated uh, honorably, if not with, with honors, and segued from that into, um, there, there was about a six month stop where I was uh, working at a record store, which I think you know, everybody Gotta involved do. in music right, ought right. to do at one time or another, only now they're all endangered species. Um, I, I, I went straight into a, a career, quote unquote, in classical music radio. And this was a commercial station in Houston where for five hours a day, I would sit in a small room surrounded by glass. I would play CDs and because it's classical music, every 20 to 30 minutes, I would open up a microphone and say, excuse me, that was the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra conducted by Kurt Mazur in Beethoven Symphony Number no. 5 in C sharp minor, Opus 67. You're listening to the voice of the arts in Houston, K Arts. And, you know, <laughs> thank you. Gold. Gold. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do your answering machine message if you like. Um, the Carl Castle of New York. It, it really, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, what I was doing during those five years, though, was, um, you know, sort of ambling along, absorbing repertory while using every New York connection in my Rolodex with the burning desire to get to New York. Um, my sister, did, she's three years younger, she did her undergrad at New York University, so I went up to visit her, and the first time I came up out of the subway, it was like one of those, um, I'm always getting this wrong, but it was like the Mary Tyler Moore throwing your hat in the air. It's like looking around at the skyscrapers and seeing things that I'd never experienced and, aut camera. and, and yeah. automatically feeling like this was where I was supposed to be. Yeah. And I moved up in 1993 um, in a brief detour to my um, journalism career, although not at all a detour uh, in my communications career. I actually segued into a PR gig for seven, uh, for, for seven years, I stepped away from journalism and went into public relations. And it was a, it was a good thing for me in a few different ways. Um, partly because, well, I needed a job and somebody hired me and brought me up from Texas. I was working at a, at a small classical record label and a larger distribution company called Koch International which at that time was 99.9% .9 classical. It's funny, people who know Koch or it just turned into E1, nowadays it's known for hip hop and World Wrestling Federation records. Um, back then, nobody spoke the language, so I was kind of there for the transition from heavy classical to almost no classical at all. Right. Yeah. And um, I went to New York with the express purpose of being around the downtown improv scene that circulated around the Knitting Factory. Um, if you had asked me as an undergrad what would be the most radical, wonderful place in the world to work ever, I would have said, I want to go work at the Knitting Factory. It's a case of be careful what you wish for. Really? Because I did end up working <laughs> at the Knitting Factory for six of the most entertaining and exciting and horrifying months of my life. What, uh, wh wh what would you say characterized that? Um, you learn being inside some of these clubs. You, when you view them from the outside, and especially sort of an upstart like the Knitting Factory that's built on progressive music, you view it from the outside as being this sort of really, really hip together megalith. You know, I would read about the Knitting Factory in Rolling Stone or whatever. They were getting a lot of national attention, most of it propped on the back of John Zorn. And, um, when you get inside the company, and this is not specific to the Knitting Factory, it's, it's a lot of places, you find how much is actually held together with chewing gum and wire. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like pulling back the curtain and finding the little man behind the Wizard of Oz face on the screen. Right. Um, and it, it, was just, it, was a, it was a peculiar dynamic. Um, and the reason that it lasted only six months is because um, uh, somebody made a very big mistake and I graciously took the fall for it. Um, but it was- a good PR guy. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, the, the thing is, no matter what downside there was to it, the writers and artists that I met during that period are still people that I'm dealing with. I made so many contacts and experienced so many things. And I remember my, my first day on the job there John Zorn walked into the office, looked over and said, 
Steve Smith, what are you doing here? And I felt like I had arrived because John Zorn knew who I was. So um, from there, there was a little bit of freelance PR. Um, I, I represented um, a, a, a label called Columbia Records and some people whose last name is Marsalis. Um, that, was, that was brief also. And my last job in the, in the record business was actually um, I was actually telling John and Bob this earlier. I, I was the head of um, jazz and world music publicity for RCA at a time when the label was restructuring and rebuilding its roster. And we had exciting, interesting, innovative young artists and we were going to take over the world. And 10 months later, the entire division was summarily dismissed, all of us at once. Um, the, the best anecdote that I've ever had to trade on at dinner was that the entire division, which was jazz world music and classical music, all one unit, was reassigned to RCA's pop division and overseen by the executive who gave the world Christina Aguilera. And early on in his tenure, he was going through the ledgers to see what artists were selling records and setting up meetings with them so that he could perpetuate those successful relationships and sort of make a good transition. And I will always remember, and this is a true story, it has worked its way back to me, people have told me this story. Um, the executive had his assistant call the classical head of A&R and ask to set up a lunch meeting with this guy Puccini because his numbers were great. Puccini having been dead for, several, for at least 100 years by that point, it was indicative of the mindset. They had no idea what they were doing, and proof of that is that a year and a half later, they reconstituted the same division. All of our jobs that had been lost wow. with new people. <laughs> that was the point at which I said, I've learned as much as I am going to learn from being in the industry and from being in PR. I had pretty much soured on the notion of being involved with classical music and I wasn't too sure about anything else at that point. And uh, that was when opportunities arose to, um, to bring me back onto the journalism side. Uh, you, you spoke earlier about uh, no one can be just a writer anymore. In the world we live in, in the world that we're going to be producing content in, it's not enough to, to just be able to write. Could you maybe elaborate on that? Well, sure. And you just, you just named it right there. Um, we, are, we are not, um, this is something we're explicitly told at Time Out, we are no longer to view ourselves as music writers or as music journalists. We are content providers, we are content creators. And so a lot of that is still predicated on the old fashioned notion of sitting down and crafting a pithy three paragraph preview. Um, and every one of us still does that. It's still a backbone of our daily work. But we're also, you know, shooting videos, um, nothing, nothing too fancy. We've, we've talked about the whole Live at Tony series that appears on the Time Out New York website. And that's literally just one guy standing with a flip cam while somebody <laughs> plays Unplugged in our office. But it sort of picked up traction um, very quickly because the music industry also is faced with the changes in, in communications, in, in journalism. And so they have to adopt on the fly as well. So we started the Live at Tony thing, which is literally just a two minute flip cam thing. We started it with purely local, very, very small indie acts in New York uh, that we thought were interesting and wanted to, to, to promote. And before too long, we started having some fairly, I mean, not gigantic names, but some fairly prominent artists were being offered to us. I can still remember the day that we had Kevin Bacon and his brother in our office playing acoustic guitars for the little flip cam. <laughs> and um, it, you know, it, it sort of, it, it became an interesting place uh, for us to, uh, to, to expose artists in a different way. And again, it's not something that's unique to us. Pitchfork sudden, sudden, uh, surely does it. Um, Stereo Gum does it. NPR with its tiny, tiny desk, desk concerts. Yep. Um, it's, it's really just a, a way of using multimedia and the web to tell stories in different ways. And there is an increasing pressure on us uh, as writers to think in, in multiple ways, whether it's you know, photo slideshows or video and audio content or whatever, we're supposed to be taking a broader view of what it is that we produce, which is actually really grating to a few people on staff who really cling to the notion of, I am a writer, I am a journalist, I am a crafter right. of, of words. Right. 
and, and I sympathize with that, I really do. Um, one of the things that excites me about my work at the New York Times is that um, that's where I feel like I'm really exploring and improving my craft just as a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm incredibly, incredibly um, critical of my own work. I mean, I, I, I can barely you know, stand to read something that I've put out there in the world. But just recently, the, the stuff that I've been writing for the Times has gotten better. It's gotten a little bit more voice and a little bit more style, and I'm not embarrassed by it. And I credit that entirely to editors who knew in what direction to push me and how. You, uh, you spoke earlier that you've been writing for the Times now for five years, but, right. for, but for, the first, for the first few years, it was like you were always thinking, well, what would a time writer write here? That's exactly right. <laughs> you know, being in the mindset of writing for the New York Times and the, the sort of ponderous legacy that that implies where there have been so many great writers and a, a lot of not great writers too, frankly, but there have been so many great writers there over the years and the whole notion of me coming from being some blogger dork in my pajamas to actually having a platform in the New York Times, it was very, very daunting and scary to me. Um, you know, so I, I spent a lot of time writing in what I thought was a Times voice with the, uh, with the consequence that for the first few years, I don't think there was anything there that really had my voice in it at all. It was all their language and their structures and their formations. And it, it took me three or four years to get to the point where I finally gave myself permission to be myself a little bit. And you know, the example that I gave you earlier in the car is precisely the right point. What is it that I've got that nobody else at the Times has? I can guarantee you that I am the only classical music writer who has ever been employed by the New York Times who has not only used the word mosh pit in a review, but has participated in one. That's right. That's what I've got. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And, 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 and that's, that's really, really unique timing. And that is, at the end of the day, what I've realized I contribute to the mix. There are people who can analyze Beethoven far better than I ever could. There are people who know the hundreds of Schubert songs by memory. I'm not that guy, but I am the guy who grew up wanting to be in Kiss and listening to Iron Maiden and listening to King Crimson and more recently, the guy who belatedly, 10 years after the rest of the world, discovered the joy of mixtapes and going out and finding the latest variant of you know, the Nas album or whatever. Um, all of these things are things that I bring to my perception of classical music. And it's good timing because right now there's an entire generation of young classical music composers who are taking what they learned in conservatory and blending it with what they love. Whether that be Radiohead or whether that be hip hop beats or whatever, they're doing it in incredible new ways. Uh, um, ways that are not sort of the, the unholy grafting of a blues rhythm section with a very, very straight, unswinging orchestra, but, but, but really interesting hybrids where in some cases you don't actually know where classical music ends and where progressive pop begins. Um, Sufjan Stevens is a great example, especially when he gets into his more sort of chamber orchestrated stuff. And at the same time, my absolute favorite classical record of last year was by a young composer just out of Princeton um, named Sarah Kirkland Snyder, who wrote this amazing song cycle called Penelope um, that's loosely based on the Odyssey. It's a gorgeous, thickly orchestrated, beautiful piece of classical writing that just happens to have a really, really good solid drummer, a really good rhythm section, and Shara Worden, My Brightest Diamond, is the singer. So it's not classical, it's not pop, it's this thing that is increasingly emerging. Classical. Yeah, exactly, right. yeah. And so the mosh pit example was, um, as I said, something that happened during uh, a concert called the Bang on a Can Marathon, which is an annual free 12-hour concert that explores all of these weird juxtapositions. And the mosh pit happened at about 3 o'clock in the morning when Dan Deacon played. Yeah. yeah, when when you've got Dan Deacon at a table full of electronics, you've got Arnold Schwarzenegger morphing in Total Recall on the screen overhead, and you've got two really really slamming rock drummers facing each other and just pummeling the hell out of their kids. 
yeah, of course there's going to be a mosh pit. Um, <laughs> What the classical geeks in the audience thought of it, I have no idea, but boy, it felt good to use that part of my background in a constructive way for the first time. And, you know, ag again, I'm not inventing anything. Mosh pits and mashups existed without me, and mm -hmm. I've just been a, a participant and a, a, a partaker. But as people of my generation and considerably younger are expressing those things in the music they make, you know, I feel like I've got a little bit of a leg up in terms of how to talk about that music that somebody who came strictly out of a conservatory, hardcore musicology background, you know, diagramming Schumann um, is not necessarily going to bring to bear in, in dealing with that music. And I kind of, you know, that's, that's a little bit of a crusade for me in terms of being equipped as a writer to comprehend the, the totality of what an artist is doing. You know, I, I wouldn't expect Tony Tomasini, um, the chief music critic of the New York Times, to suddenly, you know, deeply feel Kanye West mixtapes. But I would like to think that he is able to comprehend that it's something that went into the making of this piece that he's confronted with. Right, right. Uh, you, you talk about, um, working with content producers and being a content producer. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us in here uh, either love or make music ourselves, and right. we're very passionate about it. Right. Uh, and we uh, vicariously experience that through uh, writing. We write a lot about our music. What are some of the pitfalls that you've experienced or that you've seen that you've sort of stumbled through about writing about music? Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, how, how do you mean in terms of? Well, you know, are there, if you're, list, if you're doing an album, an album review, or, yeah. you're a, yeah. or you're, say, I saw this concert last night, mm -hmm. you know, what are some things that someone trying to say what they felt maybe shouldn't stay away from, should, should just say, you know, that's not what I'm going to talk about? Are there certain things someone should, um, are there certain guidelines that have helped you write a good review, you know, or a good, um, whether it be a good concert review or a good album review. Well, not really. It's just, it's, it's kind of like it's, it's different every single time out. That seems like a very superficial answer, but everything has to be taken individually, and especially in a, in a concert review situation, um, the, the last thing that I want to do is sit there and give some kind of bone-dry analysis of, you know, the, the Allegro movement of the Beethoven Pastoral was played much too slowly to be effective. That might be a part of what I'm writing about, but I also, you know, ideally what I want to do is give an informed opinion of what it is that I witnessed, the totality of it. I mean, if you, if you read the, uh, the review of the Budapest Festival Orchestra in New York that I wrote for the Times last week, you know, part of it was about how did they play the Haydn pieces, how did they play the Stravinsky pieces, but part of it was about sort of what the vibe of the crowd was like and the fact that the conductor was shouting out for requests when they came out for the encore or the fact that at one point in the concert, you know, um, they were doing a little bit of almost comedy. Um, they played Stravinsky's tango and a violinist was walking across the front of the stage and a violist grabbed her by the wrist and took away her instrument and they danced a tango during the entire piece. This doesn't really happen during your run of the mill classical concert and so, it's, it's really sort of like um, giving an informed uh, opinion of what the entire thing was yeah, like. Not yeah, music. yeah, and you know, that holds equally true for, you know, when I went to see, okay, you're gonna wince now, I promise. Uh, when I went to see Justin Bieber at Madison Square Garden. Oh, um, what was that like? I can now tell you honestly that I know the sound of 20,000 shrieking 11-year-olds. I'm sorry to hear that. It is intense as any Mertz ballad. It's like if someone made Twitter audible. Exactly. <laughs> That's very good, yeah. Um, but it, but it's, it's something where I really felt like I wanted, to, I wanted to know what that experience was. I wanted to go and see a Justin Bieber audience, not, not necessarily to, uh, to immerse myself in, in the Bieber artistic, art. yeah, exactly, exactly. But it is a phenomenon that I feel like you ought to be aware of if you're working <laughs> in the music industry. And that, that's on the time outside of things. I do have a little bit of a bipolar thing where there's not so much bleed between what I do for the times and what I do for time out. It's pretty much 
sort of this this yin and yang mentality. Yeah, but um, but it it it, it does in, inform uh, the two inform one another. I think in in some ways at least. Um, pitfalls. Um, I can tell you that the first time I ever had to give a strongly negative review in the New York Times, I made myself so sick that I missed a vacation trip to San Francisco because oh I couldn't God. get up in the morning or go get on the plane. I was just tying myself up in knots. I just felt so gross that I said these negative things about a very prominent New York orchestra. Um, and the, the crux of the argument was that this particular orchestra, its entire reputation is built on playing new music by contemporary composers. And quite frankly, I thought that they mangled it. They had done disrespect to some very interesting pieces by composers like Steve Coleman, who is a jazz saxophonist, who might not ever get another opportunity to write for orchestra. So if his one outing was sort of mangled by the players, you know, my fear was that somebody who was in that audience would say, oh, well, this is a reputable orchestra, and I know their legacy, and I know how important they are, so therefore Steve Coleman can't write for orchestra. <laughs> he, right, right, yeah. That it would all fall back on the composers. They would take the fall. And so I basically wrote that. I wrote it very passionately that these composers were misrepresented and that listening to these particular performances of not only Steve Coleman, but also there was a piece by Charles Mingus on the program. There were a few other things. I said, you didn't get a fair representation of any of these composers who deserve a better chance and a better hearing. And um, so I was terrified. I, I went over that review with the copy desk. Uh, we uh, typically, when I filed a review with uh, with the New York Times, what happens is it goes to my editor, who makes a few tweaks to it, and then it goes to the copy desk, and the copy desk will call and parse every bit of language in there and say, "Do you really mean to use this word? Is this sentence really what you th is it really saying what you think it's saying? I don't think so." Um, and I, I must terrifying. have spent yeah. I must have spent two hours on the phone with copy editors, just worrying over every single nitpicky little line. And so Monday morning rolled around after my weekend of having missed my trip to San Francisco, and the piece appeared. And the first email that I got was from an audience member who was also an artist who said, "Amen, I was there. It was dreadful." <laughs> the second was from a composer who had the most successful piece on the program. And he said, I had been warned in advance about conditions and that they weren't going to rehearse properly and that it was going to be shaky. So I wrote a simpler piece, and that's why it wow. worked. And the third one, which I will always cherish, was from a member of the board of directors of that orchestra oh who said, I've been complaining about this for five years. And invariably, any time I say, we've got to bring up the, the level of performance, the response is, if we're so bad, why are our New York Times reviews so good? There you go. So, <laughs> Changing the game. So I, well, or at least allowing myself to suddenly realize that, yeah, maybe I did have a specific perspective and a specific message that was a valuable part of the New York Times mix, that I wasn't just some pretend poser blogger who stumbled into this gig, that maybe there was something I could contribute that was unique and valuable. Right, right, right. Uh, you obviously write very passionately, and you talk very passionately about music. Uh, now, in the scene of 21st century, 21st century content production, we're not just competing with other musicians. We're competing with video games. We're competing with movies. And we're competing for most of those things uh, without any money, just time. Yep. Uh, yep. What, uh, what sort of passion do we need to propagate to get people excited about this music? I mean, we know. We know everyone out there has music that they freak out about, mm -hmm. that we think is just you know, God's gift to earth. And we have this passion. But, but what, are some ticks, what are some tips you can give us for channeling that into a way to get other people as excited as we are? Well, I don't think that there's anything that I can tell you that you're not <laughs> already doing in terms of just what we were talking about earlier today. I mean, social media has been such a great leveler in terms of anybody can put something up on YouTube and you know, with, with with a, a, a smidgen of genius and a stroke of luck, get a million views and possibly parlay that into a, a career. I think about that. I can't even remember what was this duo's name. 
How do you feel? No, I'm thinking of Pomplemousse. Oh, you right. know who I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that, that, that guy and girl who, who made multi tracked songs together in the sort of Les Paul, Mary Ford, old school way with new digital technology. And now all of a sudden, you couldn't turn on the TV over Christmas season without seeing their car commercials. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, ag again, um, you know, indie rock bands are ending up in TV commercials all over the place. Right. And I have a, a friend who was a Time Out staff music writer who decided that she was going to quit and make a record. She actually made it. She was from here. She used to write for Gambit. And um, uh, she made her record down here. I think it was one of the last things that the late Alex Chilton worked on. Mm -hmm. And so she made this little tiny EP that was sort of like the kind of thing that once upon a time you would have just handed out to your friends as, as kind of a calling card or you would have posted on your own website. I heard one of her songs used on Parenthood the other day. There was her voice coming right after the Bob Dylan theme song and in a scene with Lauren Graham. So wow. you know, really, I, I, I don't know how that placement happened, but it tells me that there, there are new channels open that maybe weren't there before. And you know, again, Facebook is a, is a huge tool now that, that everybody except tool. me is right. using. A you know, huge tool, exactly. <laughs> Did I say that? Um, Twitter, I'm extremely fond of. And Twitter has been just a, a godsend for me in terms of I don't even think of it as much as a social platform as a hyper-personalized news feed where I've got the, the hype bots and gizmodos and I've got Pitchfork and I've got a variety of record labels and a variety of writers and a variety of artists and you know at the same time you're using it for real time results about what's happening in Iran or what's happening in Egypt. It's basically a customizable news experience where if the mainstream media, be that NBC News or Rolling Stone or Time Out New York, is not giving me exactly what it is that I need, I can build my own Sort of, there's an app for that, more or less. You know, I can I can build my own newsfeed. The danger there is that you can expose yourself to only one ideology. You can paint your world in a shade of black or white rather than getting all the gray nuances. But I, I, I tend to think that people use social media to broaden their perspectives rather than to shrink them. Certainly a glass half full guy. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, Maybe three quarters. <laughs> Maybe yeah. all the way. Yeah. We, uh, we talk a lot about, we use, uh, we use a lot of, uh, we use a lot of buzzwords when we talk about this, like the social media and the, the personal marketing when we talk about Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think the future is for our, I mean, can there be a coexistence between our, our hyper-personalized news feeds that we get from our different, the, our, our Twitter feeds, our Google readers, uh, or um, with that and our, and our Fox News, as God forbid, or our CNN or whatnot, uh, is there going to be, is there going to be a war, Steve? What's going to happen? Is there going to be a, a war between, like, what is, are we going to, is the multimedia Twitter world going to take over the traditional news world, what do you see is going to happen? What's I, don't, prediction? I don't think it's going to ever take over the traditional news world, but I think the traditional news world is in the process of morphing into something that is more flexible and more congenial to people who are by nature on social media. I think, you know, at the, when you've got an entire media unit now at the New York Times that exists to, much as in this room, combine business and music in new ways and this business this music business unit that they just put together is in fact not strictly a reporting unit but a multimedia unit where they're very much involved in creating video content and creating podcasts and you know i mean because it's the new york times it's stiff and it's slow but it's 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 a sign it's a sign that even those who have always traditionally viewed themselves as being in a position of privilege and inviolable power are having to change with the times because right now, you know, I, I dare say, I imagine that the majority of people in this room uh, don't turn to the New York Times first and foremost for their arts news. They're probably turning to places like Pitchfork because Pitchfork has become, in the matter of moments, sort of the voice of authority. It is the 900 pound gorilla to which the music industry now kowtows. Yeah. So, uh, again, those of us in more traditional platforms are, are finding our jobs changed. Um, 
you know, I, I, I used to just write in a word processing program and lay things out in a, in a design program and you know, I, I, I would do traditional edits with my traditional writers and now we are, we as the writers and editors at Time Out, are now also the, the actual back-end web producers. We are going into Drupal. We are actually manipulating everything ourselves. You know, our production department has actually been taken away from us and reassigned to, I, I don't even know what it is that they're going to be doing now. I think they're going to be integrating ticket sales so that when somebody reads a review and they say, oh, I think I'd like to go see Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, then they can press a button to buy tickets and we get a cut. I think that's what our production department does. All I know is that all of a sudden I've got my sleeves rolled up and I'm bridging and resizing photos and you know, it's uh, oh brave new world. Well, uh, well, we certainly can't thank you enough for your time. We're gonna open the floor up for questions. Does anyone have anything they wanna ask Steve? Anything, anything, really. <laughs> Josh, stand up so we can all <laughs> gaze at you. That's, that's a great point, and especially, especially in Time Out, uh, the physical magazine has shrunk to the point where the, the music section used to be uh, 15, 16 pages long, and that's including previews, reviews, articles, and a comprehensive set of listings for what's happening in the city. It's now eight pages, so we have so much less real estate that I basically tell writers, um, unless something is so toxic, uh, a record say, unless that record is so toxic and it's going to be so big that we feel the need to warn people off from it. Like say if the, if the latest Kanye record had been a complete dog, you know, then there, there is some value in going into print saying this is a record that you're going to be hearing about but it's really terrible and here's why you should stay away. But with such limited real estate and with only a sliver of people's attention, I don't generally find a whole lot of personal satisfaction in filling my pages with something like that. And so instead, you know, I do view my mission as exactly that. And so, you know, I write about what excites me and when writers pitch me, you know, I'll frequently get from, from freelancers especially, I'll get a laundry list of, I could write about this or this, or this, or this. And my response is invariably, yeah, but which do you want to write about? Which of those things are you so fired up by that you have to tell the world what it is that you've heard? You have to stop everybody and command their attention for that five minutes on the toilet and say, you've got to read about this thing that I just heard. And that is really, that also explains the weirdness of my, my, my scattered focus because I genuinely love um, you know, the Norwegian band Immortal, and I genuinely love John Zorn and that whole downtown jazz scene, and I genuinely love Miley Cyrus. It's on tape, it's on tape, Steve. It's on video, <laughs> I'm, it's all over the world. I, I, I genuinely love the craftsmanship that goes into making those records around her. Whether she is the greatest vessel for them or not, she's a charismatic performer, but I just love that really, really squeaky clean, well-crafted pop. Uh, and she doesn't annoy me like Justin Bieber does. Um, I, I, I freely confess, and I know I'm still on camera, that when I went to that Justin Bieber concert, I was kind of sitting there nodding my head and saying, oh, Sean Kingston, hmm, okay. Oh, oh, Usher, boy, he sure is a whole lot better than Justin Bieber. And then unannounced, because they were shooting this gig for Justin Bieber's forthcoming 3D movie extravaganza, Miley Cyrus came out and I was just kind of sitting there saying, wait, wait, really, is that really? Because I've never seen her before. And I got very excited and then I thought, wait, it's really, really perverse that a 43-year-old who works for the Times as a classical music writer is getting misty because Miley Cyrus just walked on a stage. <laughs> but there it is, and I'm happy to own it, and I think my willingness to own that and my willingness to just basically transparently be, be motivated by music that excites me 
I think that is my contribution. I think that that's really all I've got because there are other people who know a whole lot more than I do and they know various niches in a whole lot more depth than I do. But if I get really, really excited by, again, just pulling a name out of a hat, there was this, um, there was this hip hop trio, now a duo, but a trio at the time called Tanya Morgan that made a record that I thought was absolutely the best record that came out that year. They didn't make any other critics picks list and you know it didn't bother me. I put it at number one on my list and they said thank you and probably sold 10 more copies and life went on. But it's really, it's, it, that, that's what I have to contribute. Right. It's what I get excited about combined with what I will congratulate myself for having the ability to express why I'm excited. Right. And, and what that music might have to offer to somebody else. Right. Do we have any other questions for Steve? Nigel? Is there a science behind checking out the width and thickness genres before you play that effort to find out how the bass really sounds? You know, I, I, I don't think there's any kind of a science to it. Um, what I typically find myself doing is you know, I have the artists that I like, and I just read them, and I find out what they like. Because chances are, you know, if, if I like Bob's work, and Bob is into Damon Smith, chances are, if I check out Damon Smith, I'll find something to connect to. You know, I, I, I trust the artists that I get interested in, and so I, I let them sort of be my guide. There are also, there are a handful of writers whose taste that I largely trust, and so, you know, uh, Alex Ross, the, the classical music critic for The New Yorker, if he gets excited about something, I will typically follow it because I've learned over the years that he and I have similar taste. Um, I also am just like a gigantic fan of downloading anything offered to me for free just because you know there's, there's no expense to it and if somebody puts up an MP3 on their blog or if somebody, you know, some of these band camp things where you can stream an entire album, you know, I'm, I'm, I am insatiably curious and in some ways that I could be accused of a, of a sort of a, a superficial attention span in terms of flitting from one thing to the next, but it's kind of like just sampling a little bit of everything and then the things that really excite me are the things that linger and I still get excited about all of those things, although Miley seems incapable of making a good record anymore, but you know, I, 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 I hold out hope. <laughs> Any other questions? Right there. How much do you travel um, Not as much as I would like, um, mainly because the timeout job especially, because it is a five day a week full-time plus gig where I'm responsible for my own duties and I'm also responsible for overseeing five other people. It's very, very hard for me to extricate myself from that. Uh, from the times, it's easy because I'm just a freelancer and I can say to them, I'm not available these two weeks. And that's actually what's going on right now is I told them, okay, from this point until this point, I'm not available. And they have other people to compensate. At time out, what happens is, um, I basically, if I'm gonna be out for a week and a half, I do that week and a half in advance. And it means ridiculously long nights and staying at the office until three or four o'clock in the morning or working from home or whatever it is. Um, the net result being that there is a very large incentive for me to not travel. And that's a bad, um, that's a bad impulse. Because I think traveling uh, should be a bigger part of what I'm doing. Um, now, having said that, I may have traveled selectively, but um, I tell you, if it wasn't for these jobs, I can't imagine anything that would have ever taken me to Pyongyang. You know, getting to go to North Korea is slightly easier than getting to go to the moon. And the fact that I was there for 48 hours covering the New York Philharmonic's visit in 2008, you know, I'm still sort of speechless at the notion that you know, my Twitter avatar, if you blow it up, is a picture that I took of myself standing in front of Kim Il-sung Airport. It, it's really freaky. So, um, you know, the, the job has enabled me to go places that I would not have gotten to as easily or in that particular case at all. And I would love to be doing more of it. Right this minute, I am trying very, very hard 
to convince my editors at the New York Times that they very, need, they very badly need me to be in Reykjavik in May when the new concert hall opens in Iceland. Not because the Iceland Symphony is playing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, uh, not because the Iceland Opera is doing something special, but because I happen to know that the secret unannounced guests that are going to be participating in these concerts are Bjork and Sigur Ross, and that's hugely exciting to me. The fact that we're gonna get this mix of all these people in the same place at the same time, and what, 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 what might they do together? So uh, it, it, it's an uphill battle to, to convince editors who don't even know what a Sigur Ross is, but... Um, <laughs> But I'm getting there. I, uh, the short answer is that I wish I could travel a whole lot more and you know, the workload doesn't let me do it as much as I'd like, but I do think that going and seeing other scenes and partaking of other music cultures, wh whether it's just coming down and visiting and seeing how New Orleans community works, or I mean, you know, it embarrasses me to say this, I've been to North Korea, but I've never been to Seattle. You know, so I, I, I could be better traveled. We have time for about one more question. Anything you'd like to ask Steve? Your views for the episode of the does that ruin a lot of music stories? Hmm. Well, ruined in what respect? I'm a music critic. Huh. <laughs> you know, there, there, there are bands and acts that I choose not to listen to, but I, I can't think of anything that has been really completely invalidated to the point where I don't at least recognize that, that it has something to say to somebody. I mean, there, there are bands that I just flat out am not interested in and don't really understand the appeal. I mean, Black Eyed Peas would be one, and I probably stepped on somebody's sacred cow there somewhere in this world, but... Um, you know, I, I don't get that band and I don't get their titanic um, popularity. And I've listened and I've tried and I've gone back and I've been patient, but it, it just, it doesn't do anything for me. So as a critic, I don't take, I, I don't put an effort into taking pot shots at the Black Eyed Peas. I just put my effort into trying to avoid them as much as possible. And I, I think that again, you know, when with, with space shrinking and time being at a premium, um, again, it goes back to spending most of my time as an advocate for the things that I do believe in rather than, you know, uh, spending a lot of time thinking about the things that I'd rather not listen to. And, it, you know, if you, if you twisted my arm, I could probably come up with more and better examples than the Black Eyed Peas of, of bands that I don't understand the appeal. But, um, uh, in my time out job as an editor, I think being an editor imposes a sort of uh, forced objectivity where even if I can't stand a particular act, I have to acknowledge the value of covering them in the mix of things that I give to people. And a lot of the things that I print in time out are not things that I'm personally excited by. But if one of the writers who works for me or one of the freelancers who contributes is excited by something and can make a valid case for it, then I'm happy to run their, their perspective. And that is, in fact, why Time Out New York has covered the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> well, Steve, we can't thank you enough for coming to Loyola. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. <laughs> He's been Steve great. Smith, everybody. <laughs> thank you.